Was Hawking right to say that modern science has killed philosophy? Is philosophy dead? Has it rendered philosophy obsolete? Should we now be looking to science to answer the big questions and not philosophy or religion? Or is there other areas of, science, of, of understanding that science can't reach? Um, each of our speakers will get a few minutes to put their, their case. We'll then have a discussion um, which I'll gently direct and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. So, without further ado, Lewis. First of all, I think Hawking is absolutely right. <coughs> he has my fullest support. <clears throat> I've never really understood what philosophy has told us that wasn't obvious or trivial, I must confess. Uh, there are a couple of exceptions. Aristotle really was quite useful, very useful, when he thought about logic and things like that. But otherwise, I really don't understand what philosophy is about. What has philosophy discovered? Perhaps they're going to explain and tell us that. There are various things that science doesn't explain. Science doesn't tell us how to do politics, but... Um, is there a philosophy of politics? No, there's the study of politics. Now, the nice thing about science is that you don't have... Sorry, let me make it clear. There are people who study the philosophy of science. That's true junk. And I have a nice quote <laughs> Thank here. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a nice quote here from a famous physicist, Richard Feynman. Philosophy of science is about as useful to scientists as ornithology is to birds. He's absolutely right. There's no scientist that I know of any distinction that takes philosophy of science in any way seriously. Science is really looking at evidence, being internally consistent, and trying to find out how things work. And science has made amazing discoveries and are doing extremely well. And it's got absolutely nothing to do with philosophy, I'm glad to say, because philosophy is... Sorry, I must tell you, I do think that a lot of philosophers are very clever, and the language they use is, you know, is, is quite charming, but empty, <laughs> empty beyond words. Well, thank you for being so delicate. Um, <clears throat> Jonathan, I dare say you have nothing to say yeah. back to that at all. I'm going to try and pour some meaning into the empty vessel of uh, <laughs> philosophy. The short answer to the question has, is Hawking right to say that modern science has killed philosophy, of course, is, um, is no. <laughs> um, I'm going to say something in re direct response to what Lewis just said and then try and, try and make the case. Um, <clears throat> There's an important assumption that shapes everything Lewis says, that um, philosophy is junk because it doesn't discover things. And I think that's the assumption that I want to um, <coughs> question. I'm not, uh, I wouldn't deny that philosophy doesn't make discoveries, but that doesn't render it, render it otios. Um, I just want to start with a question of clarification, really. It's not clear to me what Hawking thought he was pronouncing mm. uh, a death sentence on. Um, Hawking says that the problem with philosophers is they haven't kept up with recent developments in science, but I think the problem with Hawking is that he hasn't kept up with recent developments in philosophy. Um, it's, I suspect what he had in mind was postmodern philosophy of science or the strong sociology of science, but it's worth saying that there's more to philosophy than scepticism about the ability of science to describe or explain the nature of reality. Um, <coughs> or the, the way the world is as it is in itself, independent of local perspectives. So there's more to philosophy, I think, than, than, Hawking, than Hawking thinks. I want to make two broad points very, very quickly. Um, and again, I think the, the first of these points um, responds to something that Lewis just said. The first point is that um, ph philosophy, or certain philosophical assumptions, Pache, Lewis, Wolpert, do play a role in science. And the second point concerns the relationship between philosophy and science. Um, and it seems to me that there are better and worse ways of defending philosophy against the kind of attack that someone like Stephen Hawking, Hawking makes. And the key to the defence I'm going to try and sketch is a distinction between science as an explanatory enterprise and philosophy as an exercise in uh, clarification. Um, so let, let's, take the, um, let's take the first of those points first. I mean, Hawking is indifferent or hostile to philosophy, but it seems to me that science 
um, brings with it a large consignment of philosophical freight, and some of that freight was evident in what Lewis just said. I'm talking about assumptions about the nature of evidence, assumptions about the nature of valid inference, theory construction, and so on. Now, those assumptions aren't always made explicit uh, in scientific practice, but all scient practicing scientists nevertheless take them for granted. Mm. Second point, and I'll, I'll be very quick. The second point, there are better and worse ways for philosophers and the defenders of humanistic understanding more broadly to defend what they do. The bad way, and it's the way I, I, don't, think this is, I don't think this is how we should defend philosophy, the bad way is to insist that philosophy and science are in the same boat. Um, that's to say that, and to say that neither succeeds in describing the world as it, is, as it is in itself, independent of local perspectives. I mean, we can't deny science's extraordinary success in delivering such things as planes which stay in the air, penicillin and, less benignly, nuclear weapons. So philosophers should acknowledge that there are things that science does better. It's better at explaining galaxies, for instance. But there are also things that philosophy does better. <coughs> For, ex uh, for example, making sense, in that Bernard Williams sense, of human behavior, making sense in particular of our intellectual activities. Um, the corollary of that point, that science does something better, the corollary of that point is that it's not to denigrate science to say that there are certain domains of inquiry pertaining principally to human behavior that lie beyond the purview of science. I don't think to maintain that is to denigrate the achievements of science in any way. Just a simple example to demonstrate, and then I'll stop. Um, imagine a cricket umpire. He raises both hands in the air to indicate that a six uh, has been scored. Now, we can describe and explain that physical movement neurologically and physiologically, and, and that would be very interesting, especially if we do it with the aid of MRI scans and so on. But we can't understand that gesture in that way. To understand the gesture, we need to make reference to the rules of cricket, which are products of social life at particular times particular times. Um, so I want to say that there, are, there is something distinctive about the way we understand and clarify human behavior that lies beyond the purview uh, of science. And that kind of understanding is historical, and it requires an imaginative identification with the past. Thank you. Steve. Uh, first of all, I want to say I will be defending philosophy, but on somewhat different grounds from Jonathan. And I should also say um, that I have some history here with Lewis, as was perhaps <laughs> alluded to in the beginning. Um, and I just want to say a little bit about this, because um, part of my view about the relationship between philosophy and science uh, is that they're not distinct disciplines, strictly speaking. I think part of Jonathan's assumption uh, is that there's a division of labor, almost, between the two fields. And I do believe that there's continuity between science and philosophy, and it's quite legitimate for philosophers, uh, especially at the normative level, to ask what is the point of doing science, what is the goal of science, why should we value this particular form of knowledge over other forms of knowledge. So that's the level at which I would pitch my defense of philosophy vis-a-vis um, -vis science, is that in a sense, philosophy provides kind of the normative focus uh, for science, uh, and in a sense, Lewis is presupposing certain philosophical views about the nature of science uh, that gives his view such clarity and focus. And it's not something that, as it were, is just given by the day-to-day -day activities of empirical scientific research. I mean, to give you a, uh, give you a sense about this, um, you know, supposing we took a scientific attitude toward the history of science itself, and we actually looked at the empirical track record of what science has produced over the course of its history, everything it's produced, everything that's been responsible for, everything that would not have happened had it not been for science. And of course, one can easily talk about uh, all the great medical discoveries and all the, the great sort of technological innovations that have enabled the world to be a more human-friendly place and so forth, but also we would have to talk about all the devastation that's been done. Uh, I mean, uh, Jonathan alluded to the nuclear bombs and things like this, but also environmental despoliation over a long period of time, perhaps even a reckless bringing into existence of human beings for whom we had not thought in advance we would be able to do anything with. Okay, all of that is also on science's doorstep. And if we did an empirical balance <coughs> sheet of the pros and cons of science, would we say that science is the best form of knowledge and it was, the, it was better to have pursued it rather than not? I don't think at a strictly empirical level one would be able to give that sort of answer. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI-TV.